Reading from Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better to... For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be, body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I have a couple of colleagues who are going through the Sermon on the Mount this summer, and we kind of started off at the same time. We've all gone separate roads at this point. I'm not sure what one of them did with this text, but I know one of the others combined everything that Evan just read for us and then focused on the first verses that talked about lust and how if you lust in your heart, you're committing adultery. And when it came to the divorce part, he just kind of let that one go and said, if you want to know more, come and talk to me. I will say the same thing before I begin here this morning. I'm going to leave a lot of questions on the table and a lot of answers still in the scriptures. And if I say anything, that gives you question. If I don't say something and that gives you question, by all means, come and speak to me and I'll be happy to discuss this matter further. Whole volumes have been written on this issue, some of them really, really good, some of them not so much. John Murray, the Presbyterian pastor and theologian from the US, wrote a book simply entitled Divorce. And I'd love to just stand here and read it to you, except it's a bit long and and we don't want to do that. So we have to just sort of come at this in a direct way to recognize that this is the word of God, that God speaks in all parts of his word, and recognizing that we need to hear this, especially for ourselves. We don't need to ever hear the word of God in a way that has us looking to the left or to the right or to the front or the back and saying, well, I'm sure glad that that person was here. They really needed this. That is not the way we listen to the scriptures. We listen to the scriptures in such a way that the Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts, can convict us of our sins, can lead us to repentance and grace and restoration in Christ. And we need to hear that in this text today. One of the ways that some people consider this part of the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter 5, 5, verses 17 to 48, so the whole section is just to look at each particular sin addressed here. Anger, lust, divorce, unlawful oaths, retaliation, and hatred for enemies, and to take each one of those things separately As if what Jesus were doing here in the Sermon on the Mount was just pulling some random exhortations from the law and putting them here as examples of how the spirit of the law might relate to the letter. Now, I think they're more connected than that. I think Jesus had a structure that he's following, and we'll, Lord willing, get to that next week. But even if we were to take it as kind of random exhortations that Jesus brings forward to share with his disciples... I think there's something worth noting here. If we were to take it as Jesus saying, here is the letter of the law, but I say to you, here is the spirit of the law, it's worth noting that in every single case, the spirit of the law actually demands more from us as the people of God than the letter. Now that's counterintuitive because we're used to thinking that the letter of the law in the case in point here would be something along the lines of thou shalt not get a divorce. And the spirit of the law would say but the heart wants what the heart wants. We've grown used to quoting 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6 for the letter kills but the spirit gives life as if that were proof that the whole of God's law has been abrogated in favor of love, whatever you perceive that to be. 
we're so used to this that we seem to have forgotten that love was and is, in fact, the very purpose of God's law. Love for God and love for our neighbor. That's another sermon for another time, and, and unless we have another pastor here. If you want to rescue me, it's, it's not too late. That's another sermon that we can look at another time, but notice again here in Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32, how Jesus expounding the spirit of the law takes us behind and beyond the letter he takes us beyond that simple, bare obedience to the life of faith that is required by God in his word. And so he said here in verse 31, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. So that's very straightforward. That is really good so far. The predominant culture in which he was speaking and in which we live would have absolutely no problem with that instruction. If you want to put away your wife, give her a certificate of divorce. But, Jesus continued, I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, except on the ground of pornea, except on the ground of fornication and uncleanness, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Of course, this came as something of a slap in the face to any scribes or Pharisees who may have been present on the occasion when Jesus preached this sermon. The letter of the law was easy, and they liked it. Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. That was a summary and a paraphrase of Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 through 4, which actually was not a command to that effect, but was addressing more of the practical aftermath of divorce, recognizing that there would be times in a broken world when this was going to happen. But it seems that the Pharisees had latched onto that text, and they were using it as a justification for their own peculiar understanding of what we might call no-fault divorce today, in their day, what that amounted to was that the woman was always at fault and they never were. Now, this was exactly their thinking. This was their thinking when they came to Jesus in Matthew 19, and that's also referred to in Mark 10. And they tested him. They tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, in Matthew 5 we are given that so-called exception clause, except on the ground of sexual immorality, Jesus said. But the language in Matthew 19 is not, is there even one single cause that would justify divorce? It's more along the lines of, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any and every cause? What if she, what if she burned the toast or something like that? Wouldn't that be grounds? Couldn't I get a divorce? On that basis? Now, in Mark's account of this, Jesus answered them, saying, What did Moses command you? Which makes perfect sense. They knew what the law said, and Jesus knew that they knew what the law said, and they knew that Jesus knew. So they replied, and, and they replied accurately and truthfully Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. To which Jesus replied, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. And as one guy said, all God's people said, ouch. See, they wanted to entrap him. They wanted him to say something that would give them grounds to accuse him of violating the law of Moses, but instead they trapped themselves. Jesus, who knew the law much better than they did, after all, he and his father wrote it, ended up telling them in effect, yes, Absolutely, you know the letter of the law. Moses allowed such a man to write a certificate of divorce. The problem is you don't understand the spirit or the purpose of the law. In Matthew chapter, in, in Matthew we read, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So here again, as he does in all of these sections of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes them beyond the letter to the heart of the matter. In effect, he was saying, yes, there is a law that does permit divorce under certain circumstances. People are sinful. We all know that because we are all sinners. 
people are sinful and sin needs to be regulated by the law. But before there was sin, and even before there was a law, there was an order to creation which makes clear that this is not how it was meant to be from the beginning. Before the law, there was a norm established by God that could not be undone by the fall. In other words, the being, the nature of the created thing preceded the ethic. God didn't create the man and the woman, male and female, independently of one another. You know, he made Adam on one day and Eve on another day and then suddenly noticed that oddly enough, these two kind of work pretty well together. Jesus said, he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, quoting from Genesis, part of that law that his father gave to Moses. Therefore, for this reason, because God's purpose for humanity is baked into the way that he made us, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So this business of marriage and sexuality, it's not just a happy accident. It was God's good order. It is God's good order. God's good gift to the world that he made. We see it right from the beginning in Genesis 1. So God created man, as in humanity or mankind. He created him in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's the creational order that preceded the law. And that's where Jesus goes when he's taking these people behind the law. Not only that, it's a biological necessity because the very next words recorded in Genesis, that book that God gave to his people through Moses, are, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And it's probably pretty obvious to everyone that being fruitful and multiplying was never something that Adam was going to do alone, not even in paradise. So God made two sexes and they were made to complement each other, to fit together and to work together and to deeply enjoy one another in that physical relationship and to do so in such a way that in the ordinary course of events we would come to Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, so named because she would be the mother of all the living and she conceived and bore Cain and again she bore his brother Abel. The prophet Malachi also goes back to this Edenic blessing, this Edenic time and he says, did not God make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? What was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. In simple point of fact then, as Jesus stated in Matthew chapter 19, verse 6, they are no longer two, but are one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. But looking for a loophole, the Pharisees and, and many, many people since have come asking the question, but what about that certificate of divorce thingy that Moses mentioned in Deuteronomy? In answer, as we have seen, Jesus pointed to the reality that predated the law. He pointed them to the reality that was established from the beginning of creation. He said to them also, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. And then we get a recap of his teaching. Matthew 19 takes the same teaching that we find in Matthew chapter 5, but there's a little bit of a flip here. In Matthew chapter 19, he said, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And notice the complementary nature of Matthew 5. Everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So in the one text, we have the focus presumably on the man because that's how divorce happened in those days. But it also points that this is a situation that just spills over into so many lives and affects so many people. There's no loophole then. 
Breaking the covenant of marriage constitutes adultery. That is, in effect, in effect the very definition of adultery. Adultery is covenant breaking. We want to make it all about sex in our day, but it's really not. It's about covenant breaking. And of course, if you are sleeping with someone who is not your husband or your wife, then that can be a means of covenant breaking. Either way, its effects are far reaching. And that's really hard for us to hear, I know in a time and in a culture where divorce and remarriage are basically just ubiquitous. Common wisdom has long said that half of all marriages end in divorce, but one website, as a Christian website, included this happy news, and by happy, I mean not really. So what about the famous statistic that half of all marriages end in divorce? That's a bit of an exaggeration. When it comes to first marriages, and here's the good news, only 43%. This is a recent statistic. Only 43% are dissolved. So not half. I guess that's good. But wait, there's more. Second and third marriages actually fail at a far higher rate, with 60% of second marriages and 73% of third marriages ending in divorce. So again, common wisdom, and I I put that in scare quotes for a reason, also states that the divorce rate in the church is the same, if not higher, than in the world. Now here there is a little bit of good news. That hinges on our definition of the word church. An article on the Gospel Coalition website states, what appears intuitive is true. Couples who regularly practice any combination of serious religious behaviors and attitudes attend church nearly every week, read their Bibles and spiritual materials regularly, pray privately and together, generally take their faith seriously, living not as perfect disciples, but as serious disciples, enjoy significantly lower divorce rates than mere church members, the general public, and unbelievers. Uh, The same article elaborates that active conservative Protestants are 35% less likely to get divorced. That's 35% of the 43%. I'm not good at this stuff. But it's a little bit better in churches where the Bible is honored as the word of God and where people seek to live out their faith by following Jesus. At the same time, it's still all around us and within and everywhere we look. It appears that maybe hardness of heart was not a factor that went away after the first century. The thing is, and this is a hard word, whatever the reasons, whatever the statistics, Jesus said, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And most of us, if we were married in the church, that was pronounced over us after we made our vows and we married with that understanding in our heart. That's what we want. I, I, I do know, actually, I was going to say I don't, but I do. I do know of one couple, because I did the wedding, and they were planning on the day they said I do for a divorce not too far down the road. And it was deeply sad. I didn't know that, or I wouldn't have done the wedding. But most people come to that day with that desire. When they say, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part, they want it to be until death does them part. But sadly, our culture has spent the last 60 years, give or take, in thrall to a so-called sexual revolution that has been busy calling evil good and more recently calling good evil. But God's word stands. All forms of sexual immorality, including adultery, are contrary to God's law, and they are all contrary to his good order in creation. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 18 to 20, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This good gift 
of sexuality was given to unite a man and a woman as one flesh in a covenant with a portion of the spirit in their union. Outside of that covenant, or when this covenant is broken, sexuality is disordered and it's sinful and it leads to judgment. As I said at the beginning, this leaves, leads to many, many questions that can't be answered in the course of a simple sermon. But here are a couple. Is divorce always wrong? And the answer to that is no. No. Jesus himself and later the apostle both spoke of exceptions in the case of adultery and abandonment. And every case has to be considered on its individual situation, its individual merits. Even when Jesus said it was not this way from the beginning, he's not taking away that possibility that there will be cases where this is the sad thing that must happen. Now, more importantly, and I want to address this one specifically because I was asked not too long ago, are all divorced people, whatever the immediate cause, and regardless of whether or not they have remarried, are they living in a state of perpetual adultery? And I want to address this because this is something that has been taught. I don't know if it was ever taught here but I know it's been taught in some Christian Reformed churches. I know it was taught in some of the Baptist churches that I was a member of before I went into ministry in the CRC. Is everyone who's been divorced, whatever the cause, regardless of whether or not they've remarried, living in a state of perpetual adultery? And the answer, and I want to emphasize this, if I was like some of those guys I used to hear when I was a child, I would shout it. I want to emphasize that the answer to that question is no, absolutely not, no. That is not the case. I don't know how many more ways I could say it. It is just not true. Because if it were, if that was the case, then we've declared that adultery and perhaps all forms of sexual sin are just unpardonable. As if God might forgive other things, he'll certainly forgive us for those little things that we do that are so socially acceptable, but he would not forgive that. And we cannot emphasize this enough, that is not true. That is not consistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, let me repeat a little bit. Jesus said, everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. He also said, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Is adultery sin? Yes. The law of God clearly states you shall not commit adultery, and more still, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. So don't do it. Just don't. For the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. That is God's definition of marriage. And that is God's good order for human sexuality. Adultery is sin, as are all other unlawful expressions of human sexuality. And all of it needs to be acknowledged as such. And this is the difficulty that we have. Because we feel somehow calling people to acknowledge their sin, whether we're talking about sexual sin or something else, is somehow unloving. But it's the only loving thing that we can do as the people of God in Christ Jesus. For if we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar. And his word is not in us. The most loving thing that we can do for someone who is caught in sin is to call them to repentance and faith and to direct them to the new life that they can find in Christ Jesus. And this is the message this morning, and it should go without saying, but of course I'm going to say it anyway. Because this is the gospel. This is the good news. Is adultery sin? Yes, so are a lot of other things. 
But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If God were to look at anything in our life and say, well, that was a sin, and we agree, yeah, it was, and then say, but that's one I don't forgive, then he's denying the work of his own son on the cross, and God will never do that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So hear both sides of this this morning. As Christians, we are called to glorify God, not only with heart and soul, but also with our bodies and with our behaviors. In that light, that call to holiness that comes so clearly in the scriptures, we need to flee from sexual immorality. We should never use the fact that God forgives sin as an excuse to go ahead and sin in the future. We flee from it, remembering always that Jesus Christ, our faithful Savior, has fully paid for all our sin. Every bit of it. Every thought, word, deed, even our lust and our adulteries. He has paid for these things with his precious blood. And the blood of Jesus Christ satisfies the wrath of God and sets us free from the tyranny of the devil. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we have come to him through faith, if we have believed in his name, all that we've done is forgiven. The law of the spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So where we have been guilty of these things in the past, this applies to all sin, not just the one on the table here this morning. We need to repent, and we need to turn to Jesus, and we need to find forgiveness and grace in his name. And when we fall, because we will, we need to do the same thing, and we need to get up, and we need to follow Jesus. Not so that we can be saved, we could never be that, but because we have been. As the apostle wrote in Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. But we are his workmanship, created then in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Father, as we confess our sins, you are faithful and just. You forgive our sin because you loved us from before the foundation of the world and you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to pay for these things, to bear our own sin in his body on the cross, to become sin for us that we might be made your righteousness in him. And Lord, we're thankful because no matter what our lives have been, as we look at them, we recognize we are sinners and we need your grace. We need the salvation that only you can give through the work of your Holy Spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the assurance that as we have turned to you, our sins are forgiven. And then we pray, Father, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Set us free from the tyranny of the devil. Help us now to walk in holiness, to walk in love, to walk in the grace that you have shown to us. That, Father, our lives may no longer reflect the darkness, but may reflect the light of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen.